Hello and welcome to Agency Office Hours live Q&A to help you grow your agency more smoothly this year and beyond. I'm Agency Advisor Carl Sakis at Sakis & Company, and here's a preview of the questions we will be answering today, live or if you're watching the video, coming up very shortly. First, we have a question from Arizona about over-delivery, specifically how to avoid over-servicing legacy clients. Then, Alano in California has a question about legacy clients, specifically pricing. What do you do when you have legacy clients that are paying you less than your new clients? How do you diversify your revenue without taking a major revenue hit? Then we'll discuss stopping scope creep, including a new opportunity to help you increasingly stop scope creep at your agency with my new three-week workshop coming up in July, but you can sign up to get notified today to be among the first to know when that becomes available. Then Jitendra in Mumbai has a question about agency structure. Specifically, what should you think about in agency structure to make the most of client retention? Finally, my colleague Kate and I will be talking about a typical problem that happens a lot of agencies that I see often in my agency coaching work about letting things fester. If you've got a problematic employee, you just kind of let them get away with it. That is a bad idea. I mean, you know it's a bad idea, but we'll, we'll talk about some alternatives to that to speak with them to make things better uh, as, as much as you can rather than letting things fester. So if you were one of the individuals I mentioned for a Q&A spot, please be ready to unmute and come on video. If you have a question you'd like to ask at a future Office Hours event, we've shared the link for that in chat. We'll share it again later. Go ahead and include your question when you RSVP, and we'll give you a heads up beforehand if you're on the list. It's an opportunity to get 10 to 15 minutes of free consulting. As a reminder, everything's recorded, so don't share anything out loud that you don't want to potentially become public. And if you are, are joining us live, you'll get the recording later today. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for joining. And, and if you just joined the session today uh, here at Agency Office Hours, go ahead and introduce yourself in chat. What is your agency? Where are you joining us from? All right. Well, first up, uh, you know, Adrian, if you want to go ahead and uh, come off mute, here we go. Uh, thank you for joining Agency Office Hours today. Yes, thank you for having me. It's always a pleasure to hear from you and get some of your knowledge. Well, glad to help. Well, to, to paraphrase, here's the question you've asked. How do we avoid over-servicing the legacy clients that we choose to keep? Great question. If you could elaborate a bit on what you're dealing with, and then I'll, I'll help with some answers. Awesome. Yeah. So we have some clients that um, have been around for a long time, and they are larger clients, which is why we choose to keep them. Yes. But they are, you know, they've been with us through some of our growing pains. They know some of our weak spots, yeah. and they take advantage of some of those weak spots and they often bring up well you know back in 2019 you didn't deliver this perfectly so now it's 2023 and you should still give us a discount um, and we're kind of at you know that point where it's just not beneficial for us to continue with them so i figured why not reach out to you and get your input if it's any consolation you are definitely not the only agency dealing with this you know, most often legacy clients are the lowest paying and getting the most scope. You know, we'll, we'll talk uh, a bit more about pricing shortly, but it is pretty common. You know, for instance, it, if a prospective client asks me, you know, they say, I've got this client, you know, they, you know, they're, they're, they're big and they're not paying us a lot. I, I said, is this one of your longest term clients? The answer is almost always yes. So that it tends to happen. And, and I mean, it makes sense, right? If someone's been a client for a long time, you're probably not going to raise their rates as fast as you would for new clients. But ideally, you are raising it somewhat over, over time. So what to do now? So, so to paraphrase, uh, again, the question is, if you have legacy clients, 
how do you take care of them without over servicing them, especially if they know kind of everything that's happened over the years, and they have a tendency to go back and say, remember that time several years ago when such and such happened, uh, things like that, what do you do? Well, here are some things to keep in mind. You had mentioned that example of they said, oh, in 2019, you did this, and now we want, you know, several years later, you know, that, that kind of thing. I mean, of course, internally, you're probably thinking, oh, I could make a very long list of things that client you have done and failed failed to complete and, and, and this and that. I, uh, you know, kind of thing, but it, it, the ideal there is to, is to pivot there. Um, ultimately, when it comes to working with legacy clients, I recommend a strategy that I call strategic churn. And Kate, my producers shared the links to that in, in chat, my article on that. And basically it is over time, bringing in new clients to replace existing clients. Now that doesn't happen overnight. It takes time, but you know the in theory is maybe you've got a client that's paying you fifteen thousand dollars a month, and maybe if they were a new client, they should be paying thirty thousand a month. So they've been paying fifteen, and maybe you know maybe you've raised it a bit. The ideal is to replace them with at least a couple ten thousand dollar a month clients. So now you've got twenty thousand in revenue. So if they decide to leave, you've already replaced the revenue and then some. But that also gives you some room, and we'll talk more about this in, in the next segment on pricing, to say, for instance, um, you know, hey, we're glad to keep working with you. As a heads up, new clients would be paying, instead of 15, we'd be paying 30,000. But, you know, we like working with you, blah, blah, blah. Um, you know, we're willing to do the existing services for 20,000. You know, this is sort of the special client loyalty discount. And I mean, it does make sense. You already know their business compared to bringing in a brand new client mm -hmm. at, at 20,000, things like that. Um, so that, that ultimately is, is, you know, we think about my reason, options, choose, negotiation technique. You say, hey, new clients are at this, uh, you're at this. Um, would you like to keep the services for this price? Or, you know, you might have some other, other alternatives as well. Uh, you know, and then you let them choose. Now, when it comes to over-servicing, you mentioned that they're, they're often calling back to past years ago mistakes, things like that. Are there some other examples of things you're hearing from clients that are pressing to get more for less? Yes. Oh, definitely. So in the way that we're set up, the structure is we'll work. We, we work with a lot of franchise brands. So we also work with with the individual uh, franchisee. So what they're asking is only the franchisee is paying us, but now the corporate team wants to be involved in that local marketing. They want to be providing you know, strategy. They want us to be putting together you know, that next level of strategy for no cost where you know, we're, we're ultimately doing that in the background because we have to, right? We want to drive performance, but we want to be in control where they're saying, you know, write it down, tell us exactly what it is, you no. know, why it's just over the top and it's pushing past our boundaries of what we're comfortable with. In the, in the situation with franchises, with franchisees and the franchise, or, and this is true for anyone listening who has, clients that may be a subsidiary of another company, one angle to consider is use the existing relationships to help reinforce your point. For instance, if a franchisee is pushing for something that is contrary to the national brand guidelines, you can use that, right? You say, hey, that, that's an interesting idea. Um, unfortunately, you know, the franchiser is not, you know, isn't on board with that. So you're framing it as you're sort of saving them from getting in trouble with the people that, you know, hold the contract kind of thing. That's a potential option. Um, now, there also may be some pieces where doing something for a local franchisee, maybe they want something that maybe isn't, you know, violating the rules, that might be an opportunity for other franchises to do. In that case, you need to weigh, do we do some strategically free or strategically discounted work? If the idea is to build a case study that you could then sell the franchisor on you doing that for everyone else. 
it, that's not going to work everywhere. Sometimes you're just going to steal your idea and, and that's that, but, you know, depending on the relationship, um, yeah. it, it kind of comes down to who's in charge. Right. What have you noticed on that in terms of, you know, and it varies by franchise, but sort of who seems to have the most power? It's definitely the franchisor. And it's funny you mentioned the case study because they will, the franchisor will say, will you do a case study for free? Because when you do a case study, uh, it's ultimately going to win you more business, mm -hmm. which is fine, except for we want to be in control of the KPIs and the data that we share. Yeah. But they're saying, no, 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 you guys share this data because they ultimately want, and this may be over here, they want to share our case study to help build their franchise. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, because if, if you think about it, um, if someone is a franchisor, they, you know, on one hand, they're sort of the boss indirectly of the franchises, but they're also trying to build in or, or attract, sell to new franchisees, right? So it totally yes. makes sense. Um, and this might be an opportunity. And uh, Kate, if you could share my article on value anchoring, uh, like thinking about this, you know, what is the value? Like if, if you do a case study that would help them bring in, I don't know, you know, a hundred new franchisee partners, what's that worth? I, I mean, you, you know what the franchise fee is, the startup fee, but you also know, you know, over time, what is typical unit sales? What, what's the, the commission, the royalty on things? I mean, so I, I think you could easily make some projections and you know what, even if they're like, well, it's not a hundred, it might be more like, an extra 20. Okay. You, you could have a spreadsheet. I'd recommend creating a spreadsheet for this. Yeah. Um, now, if, if you've demonstrated to them, for instance, that you're going to do something that's going to bring in an extra $500,000 in revenue this year, and it'll be more over time, and they still don't want to pay for it, like it would be reasonable for you to say, oh, well, you know, 10% of that, of that value, 50,000, they're like, no, no, do it for free. You then have to decide, are you willing to do it? Mm -hmm. And ideally not, but sometimes you may feel pressure to do it, uh, but you have to decide, which actually gets into my, my next point, which is take a look at all of your clients. You know, when it comes to raising prices, I recommend something I call a portfolio approach to raising prices. It is diversified. Some clients will get a high increase, some will get a low increase, some will be in the middle, you may have some clients that don't get an increase as long as they're told that new people are paying more and their no increase is time limited. The key to that, though, is to make a list of all of your clients and identify some important information about each one. And for those who are following along in chat, go ahead and click the client ranking matrix article. Um, and basically, I link to a free spreadsheet tool that I've built where you put in all of your clients and you identify what is their current value and what is their future potential. Because you might have a client that is huge current value, but maybe say they've just gotten acquired. The future potential is a lot lower because the new corporate overlords are going to insist on you know, the agency. Um, you also might have clients or maybe they're a startup that recently got a new round of funding and you know that one of their goals is to expand their marketing. So maybe they go from low current value to maybe medium future potential, something like that. An important piece in that spreadsheet is a column about what you're going to do about them in terms of pricing and otherwise. And there's some clients where you may conclude maybe they are low current value, low future value, future potential, and um, they're just a huge pain to deal with. Those are the clients to get rid of. I, I did that exercise with a client in Virginia almost a decade ago. And, you know, I, I'd asked her what were her three worst clients. And we, you know, we talked about that. I, mean, I looked at the revenue percentage. The three of them combined were like two or three percent total of her revenue. The, the worst mm -hmm. one was one half of one percent of her agency's revenue. I was like, you could fire them tomorrow with no negative impact and indeed probably positive because they're definitely requiring more than one half of 1% of your team's time. What's your reaction to that so far? 
Um, I love it. And I've actually never thought about the value add on their end and the fact that it will help them sell and to try to put a metric behind that. And I think yes. that's hugely valuable, just, just that piece there. Um, and I am, a, I've already downloaded the spreadsheet. I wanted to tackle that because awesome. there are a lot of our clients where we've either given them, you know, a startup discount or we've done a lot of favors um, and they just don't bring in as much revenue as they take out time from us. So I think that's next on our, on our agency initiatives for sure. That makes sense. And, I, you know, I have my article about, is it ever okay to do things for free? And the answer is sometimes yes, if you're able to frame it as strategically free or strategically discounted, if it's at a discount. So for instance, you might have a client that, you know, maybe they're a match to upsell them existing services, but it's a brand new thing. And you're not totally confident about getting it done because you've never done it before. You might frame that to clients as, hey, We'll do this at no charge for three months, or we'll do this for half price for three months as we're building it out in exchange for a case study, you know, assuming you're happy with it. And then if you want to continue after that initial period, we're glad to discuss doing it at, at the regular price. The key there is you're framing it as, you know, if you're giving, you're you're also going to get something as well. Um, and it's yeah. more I like that idea because we often guinea pig new services, new delivery types with some of our clients and they are paying full price. And it doesn't go well. So if we could you know, say, hey, we'll do this and it's it's going to be at a discount or, or, you know, a lower rate, then that doesn't sting as bad when we say, you know, this isn't working out or the clients are, you know, like, eh, we thought it would do X, but it's not doing X. Yeah. So I, I like that as well. It, a related piece to consider is that not every difficult client is, you know, is an evil person. There are some out there, but in my experience, more often, you know, the, the sort of the, the, the terrible clients aren't terrible people. They're normal people in terrible situations. For instance, I, I, I had a client years ago as an agency PM and account manager, uh, where if you didn't answer the phone when he called, like say if I was in the conference room for a meeting, he would call every phone extension in the office because he wanted to talk to someone. And the thing is, I mean, his company and his department was pretty dysfunctional. Um, I, I, I could understand. The, the thing is, there's only so much you could do, um, you know, to, to help because he was choosing to stay in a dysfunctional situation. Uh, another client at a, uh, a healthcare related company, you know, my day to day contact was great. Her boss was kind of terrible. I was on the phone with the day to day person. I made a joke about something. She laughed. She said, thanks. I needed that. We don't laugh much here. Oh, <laughs> I know it was so sad, but. You know, I she had to deal with her boss every day. I only had to see her boss quarterly. So, yeah, uh, you, you have to decide ultimately, you know, where, where to draw the line. And it's OK to keep a difficult client, uh, you know, whether it's legacy or otherwise, if there aren't any other options at the moment. But ideally, and make sure to reassure the team, we are working to replace them because otherwise you, you risk um, and, you know, I have an article on this. Uh, if you keep the toxic client, you inadvertently are telling your team this revenue is more important than your happiness. And that's, that's, not yeah. It. And that's the last thing we want our team to feel. And they are, you know, at that point where they're, they're all nervous to say the wrong thing, do the wrong thing. And that is why I reached out to you. It's, I feel like it's time for us to make a good decision whatever it may be, but we need to start having those discussions. So I really appreciate your input. Awesome. Well, I, as, as we wrap up th this particular Q&A segment, what is on your list of follow-ups? I know you mentioned downloading the client, the free client ranking matrix that we shared in, in you know, shared the link. Um, what, what else is on your list? Um, I think the taking a look at what we're doing as far as the value that it adds to the clients versus 
them spinning it in the direction of it's going to help us, mm. um, making sure that we think about how it's going to benefit them as well and calling that out. And then, of course, reinforcing the strategically free or strategically discounted. That's yeah. something that I'm trying to get the, the larger team to adopt more because yeah. it is huge when you do that, you know, and you use that phrasing like, uh, you know, because you're a great partner, because we value you, mm. that goes such a long way. So that's probably one of my biggest learnings from following you. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, please let me know how it goes. Good luck. And thank you for joining today. Thank you. I appreciate it so much. Thanks. Next up, we have a question from Alano in California. Now, he shared shortly before this, something came up. He isn't able to make it live, but I want to answer the question anyway, because it builds on what we just discussed about legacy clients. Here is the question. How can we diversify revenue beyond lower paying legacy clients without taking a major hit to our revenue? That's a very valid concern. You know, you might have a large client that's a legacy client that is not paying enough compared to the work you're doing, but if they left, it would cause a significant negative impact to your revenue. That's especially true if you have a client concentration problem, which I define as a client, single client, that is 20% or more of your agency's total revenue each year. If it's 20% or more, you have a client concentration problem. You also have a client dilution problem where you've got tons of clients that are barely making up much revenue as a percentage. Ideally, you have 10 to 20 active clients. You could have more that tends to get in the way of profits unless you've done a pod structure. But, you know, what do you do? Because you, you don't want to afford, you may not be able to afford to lose those existing clients. Part of it is the idea of strategic churn that I mentioned around replacing existing clients with newer, higher paying clients. That was a key strategy in one of the case studies I share on my website about helping an agency owner grow his agency from 2 million to 12 million in revenue on a recurring basis. Uh, that's you know per year. Um, strategic churn was a big part of doing that around replacing those existing clients with higher paying new clients. And sometimes your existing clients are willing to pay more when it's, huh, you know, pay a bit more versus what new clients would pay in order to keep working with you. A lot of this comes down to how much do clients want to work with your agency versus seeing you as easily replaced. So with, with that in mind, um, you know, there's some pieces to consider. Uh, it is normal for legacy clients to pay less, sometimes a lot less, but that doesn't mean they get to pay below market rates forever. My One of my recommendations on that, on, on raising your prices, and I shared an article on the Shopify blog last year about this, is a portfolio approach to raising prices. You'll use the client ranking matrix that I mentioned earlier, that we've shared the link for that, and you'll identify who is going to get a large increase, a medium increase, a small increase, or maybe no increase as long as you're calling it out. Now, how much is high, medium, or large? That's going to depend on your agency. You know, for most agencies, uh, more than 20% in a single year is going to be getting on the larger side. But keep in mind that raising prices isn't just about raising the rate, whether you're charging hourly or on a milestone basis. You also could be identifying new opportunities, upselling additional services. So maybe you know the price goes up 20%, but you've also added some new services at full price for new clients. So maybe they end up doubling their spend. It's not all from raising prices. It's about charging more in general. Keep that in mind. Now, if your account managers don't have a strong relationship with your clients, you may need to dive in and kind of understand what's going on with the different client relationships and, you know, as you go. Now, for all of this to work, for strategic churn to work smoothly, you need to build your pipeline, build your marketing and sales pipeline. You know, if you've run into the shoemaker's kids problem, you're, you're not alone in facing that, but you'll want to take action. You know, if you haven't dedicated, if not a full-time person, at least 
a portion of an FTE to doing your own self-marketing. After all, uh, you know, salespeople are pretty expensive lead generators. It's a lot easier if you use your own marketing to generate the leads and then hand them either to you as the salesperson or if you have a sales team to the salespeople. Yeah, the salespeople can prospect, but they're an expensive way to, to do that. So, you know, you want to build your pipeline. That is going to be very important. Um, you know, if you're at a point where you don't have pipeline to replace those lower paying clients, focus on the pipeline efforts um, and try to uh, manage the scope of what you're delivering. You know, you may, even if you can't raise prices, you can still get the work done more profitably if you've been over delivering, if you can cut back on that. Uh, some of that is about turnaround time. For instance, maybe officially your turnaround time is two business days. You know, that, that is officially my turnaround time for executive coaching, unless it's an emergency. Now, if I can reply faster, I, I will, especially if it's a more urgent question. Sometimes, though, I'll say, hey, you know, glad to answer the question. Uh, can I get back to you? You know, we've got some meetings coming up. Can I get back to you by the end of the week? Usually that's fine. Of course, if it's an emergency, then, you know, then we'll escalate faster. So, you know, one piece is stop responding, you know, in an hour to every message the client sends, unless they are paying you a ton of money. And what is a ton of money? Well, it depends on where you are. Um, keep in mind, though, that as you grow your agency, typically your uh, you know, sort of minimum client size is going to grow over time. So, you know, as you're thinking about this, we've shared some links in chat around strategic churn, around raising your prices, around uh, the client rankings matrix, things like that. Um, you know, it, it, it's a challenging situation if you've got those legacy clients that are used to paying lower rates, um, but you can take action. You are not fated to deal with low, low paying clients forever. There is hope. All right. Well, coming up, we'll take a look at agency structure for client retention, retaining the right clients, the ones that you want. And then finally, we'll take a look at leadership specifically about dealing with uh, taking action and not letting problems fester on your team. That is probably one of the biggest themes I see across my work in agency coaching. And uh, yeah, but first, a bonus tip uh, from our sponsor, me. Today's Agency Office Hours is sponsored by Seikas & Company, helping you grow your agency more smoothly and profitably this year and beyond. And in particular, let's talk about scope creep. Do any of these problems sound familiar? Your team is struggling to deliver work on time and on budget, and things are often late and or over budget. Clients regularly demand additional work without additional budget, and your team is afraid to push back, worried that the client might fire the agency and you lose the entire revenue and, and relationship. Maybe profits are down and you might need to make some hard decisions about the future. If any of those sound familiar, you might have a problem with scope creep at your agency. And here's the thing about scope creep. Scope creep itself is technically neutral. It means a client wants more help. I mean, that's a good thing, right? They value your work and they want more help. The problem becomes when it's uncompensated scope creep, when they want more but don't want to pay for it. Some of the problem, though, is that the team maybe, you know, the client the client's willing to pay more, but the team doesn't feel comfortable saying yes, and that will cost more money. Uh, for instance, I, I had a consulting client several years ago where they did an initial custom consulting project, and they wanted to add on some additional analysis. And get my help building out a dashboard and things like that. That wasn't part of the original plan. So there are two owners of, of the agency on the call. And I said, hey, uh, that sounds like a great idea. That's not included in the initial plan. But would you like an estimate for that? And one of the owners turned his business partner and said, why can't we say that to our clients? Yeah, yeah. Uh, but you can. It helps, though, if you have a framework to do it. 
And that is why I've created a new three-week workshop called How to Stop Scope Creep. It's coming up in July of 2023. It'll be three Wednesdays in July, July 12th, 19th, and 26th. It'll be two hours each week, kind of a bite-sized session happening from 12 to 2 p.m. Eastern time, that's New York City time, uh, with some assignments to work on in between. And we'll cover three things. And if you're interested in this, by the way, you can't buy a ticket yet, you can't register yet, but if you click the link that we've shared in chat or in the description, you can get notified as soon as the July registration opens uh, later this spring. Uh, but you'll learn three things. One, why scope creep is happening at your agency. Two, how to stop it when it comes up. And three, how to prevent it in the future. You'll learn all of that, just six hours in the classroom plus some additional time. It's 100% virtual. Sessions are live with Q&A, breakouts. You'll meet some new people. And if you need to miss a session, either one of them or all of them, you'll miss the breakouts, but we will be recording all of them so you can refer to them afterwards for additional help, along with a lot of tools, templates, resources. So my colleague Kate and I are in the midst of developing that. Um, I think it's going to be really good. And it doesn't require the bigger commitment of, of a boot camp or, or intensive. So if you're interested in the How to Stop Scope Creep workshop in July, click the link, and then you can sign up to get notified as soon as that goes live. All right. Well, next up, we have a question from Jitendra in Mumbai. If you want to come on, uh, off mute and on camera, let's, let's go and answer your question. Well, Jitendra, thank you so much for joining us today. Pleasure. Thank you. Great to be here. So to paraphrase, the question that you asked is this, uh, about, about structure, about agency structure. To paraphrase, you asked, how should we think about structuring the agency for client retention? If you could, please tell us a bit more about, about the agency and about what made the question come up. So essentially, uh, uh, we, are a, we are a team of around uh, seven at the moment uh -huh. uh, and uh broadly we we i have one operations head who sort of see overlooks the entire everything you know uh in the, that's going on in the agency like like if i'm busy meeting clients or if i'm busy interacting with you know uh, pitching to clients and all she is the one who handles the ops and the background uh -huh. uh, there are two people who are like we call them social media executors. So they are like they are like the client servicing and the content people combined. Got like it. They are combined one point contact for every client. Got and it. then we have uh, uh, two designers. One designer is attached to each of them. And uh, apart from that, we, we work with a couple of freelancers uh, for video and for websites. So, you know, if anything needs to be done, so that is like outsourced. So that is how broadly, you know, it is structured in the moment. Makes sense. And and I would say your current headcount, that lineup of roles totally makes sense, right? It, you know, it sounds like you're handling some of the higher level client relationships, you're handling sales. You've got an okay. operations head who's taking care of things along the way. I imagine she's doing at least some project management as well to coordinate right. things internally. Okay. And then the two social media executors, and then each of them have a designer assigned to them, plus freelancers as well. If someone needs to coordinate the external freelancers, um, is that your operations head doing that, or who's the primary contact for the freelancers? Then also, it is the, the content, the content, two content people who are there, they only coordinate. Got it. Got it. Okay. So, you know, the current structure makes sense. One, one question I have to help inform what I'd recommend next what are your long-term goals? You know, what, what's your sense of where do you want to go? Is the goal to go from seven people to 70 people, go from seven to 15, go from seven to a thousand people? What is your long-term goal? Because that'll help drive the right next step. Uh, not, not too many people, to be honest, because managing yeah. headcount and managing people does become uh, challenging at times. So maybe yes. not grow more than... 15, 20 people at, at the max. Got it. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So based on that, 
uh, you know, some people look at doing a pod structure, which is worth exploring. You're basically having a miniature agency within the agency. And in a right. sense, you, you kind of have two two-person pods right now. You've got the social media executor who's also serving as an account manager, and you also right. have the designer. So you kind of have that now. But um, the challenge becomes, what if you want to offer new services? What if you're offering services that maybe, you know, some clients want, other clients don't, you know, you don't want to assign them to one team where, you know, they're not generally getting all the services. That can be a challenge. What okay. a lot of people, you know, it would make sense for a lot of people to think about, and, and, and this is worth considering for you, is, is it time to have a dedicated account manager and or a dedicated project manager? Now, the shift there would be the social media executors would continue doing the social media execution, and they might continue working with the outside freelancers, but the day-to-day -day client contact would become the account manager. And, and if we're thinking at, say, 15 to 20 people, you'd probably have at least three account managers, maybe four uh, as you're growing, um, and depending, you know, you might have some project managers as well. The upside to that approach is when a client contacts the account manager, they can route things internally, right? The client doesn't have to remember, okay, do I go to the social media executor on this? Or, oh, wait, I, you know, I've added, you know, pay-per-click ads. Wait, I have to go to the pay-per-click person about that. Or the client might have an idea where, where they're not even thinking about the execution. They're like, I've got this new event coming up and I know I need the agency's help, but like, which person do I even talk to? I, I need some feedback on is the, is the idea, the event even a good idea? And often the person advising about is it a good idea would be a client strategist. At 15 to 20 people, it probably makes sense for the account manager to also be the client strategist. Uh, whether they have a strategist title and serve as an account manager or an account manager title and they serve as a strategist, the advantage of combining that role is that you're able to manage billables, right? You're not having to pull in two different people plus okay. more for that. It, it risks watering down some of the account management or some of the strategy, but uh, you know, it sounds like you have the social media executors doing some of the lower level strategy now. So on the whole, it sounds like an upgrade. And importantly, it means that you aren't going to get pulled in to do all of the strategy work every single time yourself. So what, what do you think about that approach around, like for the future, shifting account management over to its own thing, where they are the primary contact. Clients may still talk to the social media executors, but when the AM pulls them in, the AMs would be doing some strategy work, maybe not all of the most senior client strategy that you're doing, but at least mm -hmm. over time they build up. What's your reaction to that? Yeah, I think uh, I think that does sound uh, doable, but uh, I think uh, there might be two challenges to what you know uh, what this could be. Yeah. One would be, of course, the the cost component attached to that. I mean, of course, it would be a, like a senior hiring at a senior uh, position, yes. and uh, uh, adding one more layer between uh, the the person who is doing the content or who is doing the basic content strategy at the moment. And the client, so adding one more person, uh, I'm I'm willing to try, but I don't know if that would add to the confusion or that would sort of get more clarity uh, between between the roles. So if if you were to just kind of bolt on account manager and account manager now, it definitely would add to the confusion. Here's a potential solution that would let you ease into this which is right now, if a client is directly talking to the social media executor, the client doesn't have to get fully clear on what they want because they're just talking it through. And maybe the they and the social media executor figure it out in the meeting. By the end of the meeting, the executor knows what to do. One solution is for clients to start, and, and you would frame this as a new policy, clients need to fill out a brief of some sort whether you're calling it a content brief, a creative brief, whatever it is. And ultimately the client needs to lay out and, and you could do a search online, you know, for like creative brief template 
Uh, by the way, for anyone who's listening live, if you have a favorite template, go ahead and share it. Uh, Jitender, do you currently use any kind of briefs in the process? Okay, okay. Uh, no, no, at the moment we, we don't. And, and and it's totally normal given the structure you have, which is that clients can just talk about it and, and the team comes up with it. This yeah. would be an opportunity to basically have the client create the brief where they'd fill out, here's my goal, you know, in that event example, uh, you know, here's the goal. We've booked to do this event on this date. Um, here are the particulars about it. Here's what I'm trying to accomplish. Are they trying to get direct sales? Are they trying to get leads? Are they trying to uh, accomplish something else? Whatever it is, you want to know, you know, what are their goals? Are there any constraints involved? You know, you need to know what resource constraints there are, things like that. Um, but, uh, you know, basically it forces the client to think this through first before they just verbally dump things on, on your team. If you get clients used to doing the brief, that prepares you to move things over to involve an account manager. Because in that case, the client goes to the account manager saying, hey, I want some new content. And I filled out the brief already, right? Because you've already trained them from months of filling out briefs. Uh, okay. you know, then the account manager can look at it and they're going to know enough about the work to see, is there anything missing? My favorite, is there anything missing? Was I was working on a client's website as a director of client services and we needed a vector version of their logo for the website. So I contacted the client, said we need a you know vector logo. Do you do you have that? They sent a file called vectorlogo.jpg, which it was you know obviously not a vector logo if it was a JPEG because it was going to be a raster image. So I was able to go back to the client and say, hey, rather than just forwarding that to the you know the creative team, said I, I, that's not quite what we're looking for. Do you have something that ends in .ai uh, .pdf? EPS uh, kind of thing. And then they sent us the right, the right file. So, you know, that, 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 that can happen. The account manager needs to know enough about the work to interest yeah. for that, but they may get the brief and have enough to share with the social media executor that the social media executor can move forward as is, or there may be some questions. If it's like a small question, the executor asks the AM who asks the client, who ideally is posting in a shared place where the AM and the executor can see it, or if it's more complicated, then maybe you do need a meeting. And yes, that will increase the billables because the AM and the executor are, are there, but you're going to struggle to get from seven to 15 or 20 without adding some sort of account management layer. And okay. introducing okay. clients to doing a brief upfront is going to be a big piece on uh, that transition. Yeah, I think this is also part of your, uh, of the book, Work Less, Earn More. Yeah. I've been uh, reading that. I just bought it on Kindle a while back. Thank you. Thank I, you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, and, and you know, there are different pieces about structure and the, and the Work Less, Earn More book doesn't cover every possible angle of structure. The key thing though is that, you know, and this is true for everyone, what has worked before, you know, may not always work now, and it probably won't work for where you want to be in the future. So it is smart to be thinking about what do we need to change. So, uh, what stands out in terms of what what you're going to do from from here as as next steps as we wrap up the the segment? Uh, I feel currently, uh, you know, off late. I have just started focusing more on my niche. Until now, we used to be like a very generalist uh, sort of agency. But yeah. of late, I've been focusing more on the FNB sector, you know, focusing more on restaurants and yeah. uh, is uh, growing that. So I plan to uh, first at least add a few more maybe clients at the moment and then maybe uh, start looking at... Uh, uh, also, the I like the idea of the client briefs, getting them used to... Something I think is starting the process now, getting the team also used to it. So I think uh, that should that should help. And then, you know, as you rightly said, maybe adding an AM uh, after after a few clients. I think that should that should help. And, and ultimately, the fact that you're specializing should give you some expanded pricing power. You know, we shared earlier about different ways to raise your prices. Um, you know, that'll help you create more money to pay 
the the AAM. So it, it, you're you're thinking about the right stuff. Please, please let me know how it all goes. Yes, definitely. All right. Definitely. Thanks, Chandra. Thank you. All right. Well, for our final segment today, my colleague Kate and I will be talking about a common challenge and and how to fix it. Uh, so, uh, you know, Kate, thank you for serving as producer. Kate's my operations manager and uh, uh, helps with a wide range of things to, at Sekus and Company. So, Kate, thank you. Of course. So one of the things that I've noticed across my agency coaching is when agency owners let things fester. They've noticed a problem and they choose to ignore the problem. Or maybe in some cases they don't see it in the first place, but very often they notice it and decide they'd rather not deal with it. For instance, maybe you've got a team member who isn't really doing their job, or they're always missing deadlines, or sometimes they're just not even showing up and it's not clear what's, what's going on. Uh, for instance, a client several years ago had hired a full-time team member and she realized that he was only working instead of 40 hours a week, he was only working about 30. And importantly, he was not accomplishing what he was supposed to get done. You know, if you've got a team member who's working 30 instead of 40 hours a week and they're getting everything done, I'm a little less concerned about that. But in this case, he wasn't working full time, though he was supposed to. And, um, you know, he wasn't getting things done. That's a problem. I had another client where an employee would tend to stir things up. Uh, uh, where one of the employees would, um, in fact, was encouraging other employees to quit or to demand significantly more money, like demanding way, way, way above market relative to their experience. They were really just stirring things up. In another case, a client had a head of operations who, um, you know, I think was just overwhelmed and no longer wanted to do the job that the owners needed them to do. And in each of those cases, the owner of the agency just kind of let things go. They noticed there was a problem. We, we talked about it in our coaching and they decided to just let it go. They just let it fester. Now, that does not go well. You know, it tends not to go smoothly. At minimum, you're wasting money paying people who aren't doing what you need them to do. At worst, you know, you may need to fire them and then have to pay a settlement if they claim it was wrongful termination or something like that. It's not a good situation. Plus your stress levels every day, if only they would do your job, uh, do their, well, do their job, but help you with your job. It's a frustrating situation. Um, so, you know, what can you do? Well, my, my challenge for you would be to take action. You know, Kate, I know you've mentioned some scenarios with this. What, you know, what, what have you noticed? I think we all know the phrase that communication is key, but it's sometimes hard to apply it in an agency setting. And just remember that your team, they can't read your mind. So you need to be upfront when something isn't working. Um, and if you're unwilling to provide the feedback or constructive criticism, you're limiting their opportunity to grow as an individual, as your employee, and hopefully to get them to do what you want them to do. Um, so if you do address it and there is no change, it's time to take action, but you can't just let it go. Otherwise, uh, nothing's going to improve. It, exactly. Like, like problems tend not to magically resolve themselves. You know, so the hardest situation is where someone is doing a good job at some, some stuff, but they are either doing terribly in another area or maybe they're mostly doing a good job in terms of the work, but they are a toxic team member. Um, uh, one client had so many people that like hated working with others on their team um, that, that my shorthand for them was a, um, uh, basically they, they were the, the, the sort of toxic misanthrope, right? They just didn't like other people uh, or misanthropic loner. Yes. They, they would have been better as a freelancer working on their own rather than an agency. So keep in mind, you know, what, what do you do? My recommendation is escalated handling. The first time someone does something that they shouldn't do, call it out. Hey, say, you know, I noticed you did blah, blah, blah. That's not aligned to the behaviors we need for this role, for this reason. 
will you commit to doing that differently in the future? Yes, okay, great, it happens again. Now you escalate, you said, hey, we discussed not doing that. Um, I see that you've done it again. What, what was the disconnect? You're noting not just they shouldn't have done it, it's that you've talked about it before. They may have misunderstood, right? Um, I once had a boss who said, don't do this. Great, I thought I didn't do this. And then like a month later, she was like, I told you, don't do this. And the challenge was that she was very much an abstract thinker. And so she had said one thing and expected that I would read her mind to understand it meant this whole category of things rather than just the one. Okay, well, I certainly changed my behavior after that. But if you've mentioned it once, you've mentioned it twice, and note that this is you know second time, the third time it happens, you have to think about what is going on there. In my experience, if someone has been warned and they keep doing it, it has shifted away from incompetence or whatever else might be going on, and it's shifted into insubordination. And insubordination is not okay. This can sometimes happen when you've inadvertently, as an agency leader, created a leadership vacuum. That is, something needs to get done that ideally you would be doing as the agency leader, but you aren't doing it. And so employees tend to step in to fill the leadership vacuum. So that with an agency on the East Coast of the US where the owner wasn't doing certain things, the operations head was stepping in to do them, not always doing them the way the owner wanted. And, and ultimately, when there was a conflict about how the ops head was doing things, the ops head wouldn't acknowledge or respect that this wasn't her company, that it was the owner's company. Now, I, I don't, the way he was thinking of doing things didn't always make sense, but it ultimately was still his business. So like she just wouldn't accept that it was his business, but this was partly his fault because he hadn't taken care of some areas that he, you know, he didn't like. So he just didn't do anything. A team member stepped in, but then wouldn't respect that he wanted things to be done differently. It wasn't a good situation. So, you know, thinking about that, uh, you know, I know Kate internally, we've talked about a lot of client employee challenges and, uh, and things like that. Um, you know, what, why do you think people put off confronting problems like this? I think there's a lot of anxiety and potentially irritation or, pen, you, you know, if you don't address it, you're letting it fester. So it's just growing and growing and it can be hard to confront somebody and you don't ever want to come across as, you know, you're doing it wrong. You need to fix mm -hmm. it. But yeah. in order to have those problems get fixed, you need to address them. And so allowing those situations to happen, even when it can be uncomfortable, it's for the good of your agency. There's a phrase that I refer to with some of my coaching clients of warn, warn, fire. That is, if someone's doing something, they shouldn't warn them, warn them again. And if they do it a third time, fire them. Now, you may opt to do a performance improvement plan, a PIP, something along those lines, uh, but also keep in mind that if, if you've got a problematic employee who isn't going to be able to turn things around, then you might consider counseling them out, either counseling them out or firing them. So the idea there is that if someone isn't possibly going to be able to turn things around on a PIP, a performance improvement plan, either just fire them, ideally giving them some severance, uh, in exchange for a release against future claims against the company, or the counsel out approach is to say, um, this is something I did with a team member uh, a couple of years ago, where I said, you know, hey, uh, they were like a month into the role, um, and I said that this just isn't working. You know, we had worked through some things along the way, and it just wasn't working. And um, you know, and I, I ultimately said, you know, this isn't working. Um, you know, you're welcome. If you prefer to leave today, you can. Um, I'm willing to keep you on board for up to another two weeks. I know there's some things that we're working through. Uh, ultimately, your choice. That was a case where I wasn't concerned about the team member sabotaging things or anything like that. Just like, it just wasn't working, right? Um, and initially said, oh, I'll, I'll do the two weeks. And then I got an update uh, the next business day uh, which was actually, you know what, um, I have this new opportunity that just popped up. I'm going to do that, and today will be my last day. Okay. 
the nice thing about the counsel out approach is it lets people leave with dignity and it gives them a chance to find a new job. You're not giving them forever for it, but ultimately it tends to be just nicer all around. Don't do that, of course, if you think someone will sabotage things. Well, that concludes today's, this month's agency office hours. Uh, so, you know, thank you so much for joining. This is agency office hours from Sakis and Company for March 2023. I'm Carl Sakis. I look forward to answering your questions in future editions of the event. Be sure to submit your question in advance. We'll let you know if you're on the list. And uh, good luck out there. Thanks, everyone.